that offers support outside the mainstream curriculum and lifelong learning talks uh, such as this, um, exhibitions and musical events. Um, we have a particular focus on special needs such as dyslexia and so tonight uh, we're fortunate to have a speaker John Hicks uh, who is very active in the feel, field of dyslexia. He has worked with um, tech companies uh, producing assistive technology for those with dyslexia. Um, he also runs conferences in this field and is a parent coach for um, those with a child with dyslexia. He himself, as a parent of a child with dyslexia, uh, will explore with us tonight uh, what self-esteem is and what we are seeing as parents and why it is important to have good self-esteem. And I think the, um, the goggled child in the event posting says it all. Um, we will be recording this talk so that we can post it on the Bell House website. Um, John will talk for about 40 minutes, uh, during which time we will keep our microphones on mute. And then there'll be 15 minutes um, at the end for Q&A. Um, so do please post any questions up on the chat during the talk as you think of them. So I'll hand you over to John now. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to this evening's webinar. I was just saying as we, as we were sat on, um, on here just chatting before this started that last time I came to the Bell House, it was a very wet wet evening and I thanked everyone for, for turning out and making it to the Bell House. So um, thank you for making it to this webinar and I'm glad that we were a lot drier than, than perhaps last time. So um, my talk this evening is called Why is it important for a child with dyslexia to have good self-esteem? Um, before I, I, I kind of go into my mini introduction about, about who I am, I think what's more important is to tell you why I do what I do. Um, there's a, num there's a number of things that I do and it gets a bit confusing. I just wish I was like a plumber and I could just say I'm a plumber and everyone knows what I do. So um, it's, it's easier just to say why I do what I do. And I want you to consider what I'm saying and, and hopefully you're with me with it on this. So I do what I do because I want children with, dys with dyslexia to believe in how their unique way of thinking could change the world. What we understand about the strengths and weaknesses of anyone with dyslexia and, and the wider gambit of neurodiversity is that they think uniquely. And when you think uniquely, there's a load of strengths that come with that. And um, so often we think about the, what I call the allowable weaknesses associated with these conditions when there's some real strengths there. And so it's, it's kind of my mission to help, help young people and, and children to recognize their strengths and to be able to see how they can make a difference to the lives around them and, and to the rest of the world using those strengths. How do I do that? Well, I'm just one person, so it's going to be difficult to reach out to that many kids, although I do work with young, young people. Um, I do that by working with the supporters of dyslexic children and young people, and I basically inform them and inspire them um, on topics surrounding education and parenting with dyslexia. So I work with parents, I work with children, young people, um, I do t um, coach young people um, from time. I work with teachers and specialist dyslexia supporters. They could be tutors or they could be assistive technology um, assessors and so forth. So, um, yeah, there's kind of two aspects to what I do. There's my blog, the Studying with Dyslexia blog, and then there's my parenting group, which is almost at 2,000 parents now on, on Facebook, um, through which I do a lot of my parenting online work. Let's get back onto the webinar, though. And so um, the topics I'm going to cover this evening um, will, of course, be to answer that question that we, we've entitled this webinar with. But to start with, I want to define self-esteem. I think self-esteem is one of those topics, one of those terms that we probably use an awful lot without really thinking about it. And what I want to do is um, put a, a definition out there that we can all work from at least for the duration of this webinar. 
you'll know where I'm coming from. You'll know what I'm referring to. And um, hopefully that'll be useful for you. Then I want to share some observations from parents, including myself. Um, you know, as you heard earlier, I, I am a parent of two daughters, um, both of whom are neurodiverse, um, but one of, one of whom has dyslexia. And there's been quite a journey there. And, I, and there's some good news this week about her journey, which I'll share with you later as well. Um, I'll do my pushy dad bit or proud dad bit. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to answer that question about why it is important for a child with, dy with dyslexia to have good self-esteem. Now, there's a spoiler here, right? It, it's important for every child to have good self-esteem. But I think it's particularly pertinent for dyslexia and any of those other cognitive conditions that we're aware of, you know, ADHD, dyspraxia, autism spectrum disorder, and so on. There's, there's a number there that come under the banner of neurodiversity, and that's the, the area that I work within. Okay, so with that, I'll move on to the next slide. No, no, I won't. I'll tell you about this. So, so this talk this evening will be, um, is my part one to um, two talks I'm doing. And part two is going to be at, delivered at the Dyslexia Show in Birmingham, hopefully on September the 21st. And that's called How Can I Boost My Child's Self-Esteem? Tips for Parents from a Parent. So fingers crossed with a, with a wind behind us, hopefully blowing away that COVID-19, we'll be allowed to have conferences in September. And um, if you are in Birmingham and you can get to the Dyslexia show, this will be the, the, the first one of, of its kind, this show, not my talk. Um, and um, it's specifically focused on dyslexia. So there's going to be loads of resources there that you, you can go and find out about. Um, it was gonna happen in March and it was the week before lockdown happened. So as, as you can understand, it got bumped. So, um, but there's a lot of people, a lot of organizations going to be there, lots of talks and different topics, whether, whether it's about children and education through to adults with dyslexia in the workplace. So I'd really recommend that, you know, if you don't know about this show, at least go onto their website and subscribe. Um, so that you can be kept up to date with what's happening with the, with the Dyslexia Show. They're doing some virtual talks at the moment as well, as is absolutely everyone, because we can't go out. And um, so it's worth getting in touch with them. So let's define self-esteem. Okay, so I've taken the, the definition, uh, and I really like this definition. I've taken it from the NHS website, uh, again, it's kind of buried underneath a whole load of COVID-19 web pages. Um, but if you can find it, the, the NHS defines self-esteem as this. Self-esteem is the opinion that we have of ourselves, which won't be a big surprise to any of you, I'm sure. It continues, when we have healthy self-esteem, we tend to feel positive about ourselves and about life in general. It makes us better able to deal with life's ups and downs. When our self-esteem is low, we tend to see ourselves and our life in a more negative and critical light. We also feel less able to take on the challenges life throws at us. And this is the key thing. With dyslexia, there's a lot of challenges that we come across, whether we're children, young people or adults, in whatever context. If we are struggling with this um, language disorder, as it's defined by the British Dyslexia Association, there will be context-driven scenarios where we might have struggles associated with our ability to deal with information and, and communicate information and process information. And that might be overwhelming. And this is the area that I'm sort of specialising, if you like, that I'm really keen on making people aware of this side of, of, of a child's life so we can address that earlier on in their lives. If we feel like we can't deal with a challenge, if we don't trust ourselves, that's going to be a huge challenge for us in, in getting anything done or getting anything done with any kind of satisfaction. Let me share a bit about what parents are seeing. So um, I did some work last year with the British Dyslexia Association. And basically it went something along the lines of 
um, the, BD, uh, the, the CEO of the BDA contacted me and said, John, we need to get a bunch of parents telling us about what the emotional cost of dyslexia is like. What's it like to have a child with dyslexia and the, the family relationships and the, the, and the way things work with school and so forth? Um, can you get, get a survey out? I said, I'd be happy to. So usually when I put a survey out, I, I, I'm always a bit cynical. You know, if you, if you put something out and, and, and 100 people see it online, maybe you might only get 10, 20 people do anything with it. So I was kind of like hoping that we'd get a response um, and probably expecting about 30 responses. So I was really, really blown away when I got 1,300 parents fill out that survey. And I'm telling you that not because I want to kind of boast about the size of the survey because it, it gave us an awful lot of work. Um, but it just shows how emotive this is for parents, how their child, well, how all our children are feeling about themselves. But it's particularly painful when we have a child who, who, don't, who doesn't believe in themselves. Uh, it's a real challenge. And with this um, survey, the aim was that we were going to collate all this information. There were a number of different categories that we asked questions about. And we were going to share that data with um, members of parliament across the UK with the hope to influence them about the BDA's wider plan of trying to get um, level seven trained dyslexia specialists in every school in the country. And, um, and so we got this data together and apart from all the yes and no questions there was also a text field in in for every section in in this survey that says you know what's it like for you you know tell us a bit more about your answers your yes and no answers and we've got two and a half thousand comments and um so I've, somewhere on my computer is a massive excel spreadsheet of of information from parents that i'm still sifting through so what you're about to see are are some comments that um, have only been shared two or three times on other talks um, where I've delivered this talk recently. But I hope it's going to give you an indication of how strongly people, parents are feeling about their kids with dyslexia and the emotional well-being of their child. In any social situation, he'll go to any length to avoid reading and writing as he feels embarrassed. Self-esteem is also low as he is so far behind academically than his peers. So this is kind of a classic, really, in terms of the trends that I've picked up on in my conversations with parents over the years. You know, there's, there's talk in this comment about avoidance. One of the, the huge signs of poor self-esteem is avoidance. And I'll talk a bit more about why that would be that later on. But um, there's avoidance in there, there's embarrassment in there. You know, if I do this in class, it's not going to be as good as my peers. Why are my friends getting 10 out of 10 and I'm getting 4 out of 10 or 2 out of 10 or whatever it is? Not every child with dyslexia will, will struggle hugely, but there will be levels of challenge and struggle within um, the class with dyslexia. And what we know is there's no two dys kids with dyslexia or anyone, at least two people with dyslexia, will have the same challenges. It presents slightly different for different people. He has lost all his confidence as he feels he is not the same as his peers. Again, we've got this comparison with the friends in the class. He feels like a failure when he forgets to take things to school or forgets instructions. And for me, this is the, the, the really pertinent point in this comment. It's about how the little things can really upset a child when their self-esteem is poor. You know, it might be a disaster if the packed lunch doesn't go to school. It might seem like that. But actually, that, that's not an indictment of one's personality. And yet it might feel like that for the child. It might be extremely embarrassing. It may be that you know, with the pencil case doesn't get to school or whatever. That's really embarrassing. It's another sign of something they're trying to perhaps hide within the classroom. And it's difficult to manage if they don't get intervention. So this can affect a child on, on the bigger scale, you know, with exam results and so forth. But it, just the day-to-day -day little things can, can grind them down if their self-esteem is poor. And my last comment here. 
um, is interesting. So from starting at a very low point when he left his first school, the junior school he went to worked very hard to raise his self-esteem. As they noted, it was very low. And that is music to my ears. I, I love it when a school tunes in on that level with their students. They did a wonderful job and he left the school a proud and accomplished 11-year-old. It was very frustrating as now six months later, he has started secondary school and his self-esteem has dropped again. And he now finds his dyslexia embarrassing and something to be ashamed of. And um, for me, this, this comment is a, it's about levels of self-esteem and how it can rise and fall depend, depending upon the context, depending upon the rapport with teachers and, and other staff members in the school or the friendship groups around us. Um, that really can ebb and flow depending upon the circumstances. And, and that's, again, something we need, we need to be aware of as we support our children. Let me share a bit about Jess, my youngest daughter. So um, this is Jess um, as was. Um, she's actually 21 now, but back in the day, um, this is her when she's at primary school. Um, she was a very happy, um, came over as very intelligent, but very, very able to articulate her learning. Um, you wouldn't have thought there was a, a challenge with her ability to, to process information. You know, and like I say, dyslexia is a language disorder. Um, but she also would have problems with, with reading text from a visual disturbance perspective on the page. And um, she did have quite low self-esteem, um, but it only came out when the mask slipped every now and again. On the whole, she's very bubbly. Um, there's kind of a Hicks, a Hicks tradition of doing that. Um, and what would signify things for us is that all the way through her primary school experience, um, I, would, I would read to her at night before she went to bed and I uh, would try and get her to do some reading with me. And she would say, I, I, I hate reading. I don't want to do this. And yet she'd be very happy to listen to a story. She would ask questions about a story. She, um, but she just didn't want to read, read. And when I did get her to read, she would like read the first sentence of a paragraph, for example, and then somehow she would manage to drop about four sentences and then read the last part of the fifth sentence. And of course, that would make no sense. And, um, you know, I kind of put that down to, you know, it's bedtime, she's probably very tired, she's been at school all day, um, her eyes are probably exhausted, so that's probably what's going on. And it wasn't until we got into secondary ed school education when the, the stakes were higher, if you like, there's a load more work on our plate, that we started to see um, episodes of really fundamental distress, emotional distress, um, one example was that she was asked to read out in public in front of a room of 70 adults at one point um, and a big emotional breakdown there. Um, another example was, was sitting with her. When we started to suspect dyslexia, we were talking with her form tutor in a meeting and, and bear in mind she was 12. She was, she broke down sobbing about her thought that she was going to fail the GCSEs. So we've got a 12 year old speculating about something that's going to happen in four years time, right? A 12 year old shouldn't have to worry like that. And yet she was worrying like that. And, um, and so we got her support. We were very fortunate. We were able to um, afford a, an assessment, got her an assessment with recommendations, took it into the school and the school supported us with this. And we're really pleased to say that she got good G GCSEs at the end of that process. Um, this is her now. So um, the, the good news I want to, want to share with you is that literally this week we got her degree results. She's 21. She's just done a musical theatre degree um, and she got a first. Now, I tell you this not because I, I want to do the, well, I'm proud, but um, I tell you this because there, there, there's like a, a thing that we can do as parents, we can have hope. And if we have hope, we start to help our child to have hope. And sometimes we need to kind of sit with our kids when they haven't got hope. Um, and, and what we found during the period of secondary education is that she started to get into music and dance and singing. 
And that was her thing. We tried loads of different things for both our kids to get them to do stuff that they'd really enjoy. Um, and this was very much her passion. And, and for me, it's my belief that this was the thing that told her that she had value, she had worth, that she could use to demonstrate to herself that actually the self-defeating -defe thoughts are incorrect. Um, and it was really interesting that when it, when it came to choosing um, A-levels, she, she actually applied to the um, same sixth form as my other daughter, um, and it was a, a top sixth form, state-run sixth form in Cambridge, where I'm based. And, um, and they gave her an offer, and she said, you know what, I don't want to go there. I want to do a, a vocational course in musical theatre because I want to be on the West End. I've got a dream. And we went, don't you think, no, I want to do this. So we supported her. And um, so she went off and did her musical theatre degree. Um, there's no musical theatre industry at the moment, so it's a little bit of a problem. But um, already she's, she's mapping out what it is that she wants in life. And you can only do that when your self-esteem, when you start to believe in yourself. So I just want to share some hope. Um, I don't know what your circumstances are on this call. But um, if you are literally at the start of the journey, it can get better. And one of those tips would be to just get your child doing everything they can possibly do. Try everything. Just see where their strengths are. Allow them to see their strengths in what they do. There will be things that, that won't work out. It will probably be expensive. Um, but it's worth exploring things to do with your child that your child can get into. So let me answer the question. Why is it important for a child with dyslexia to have good self-esteem? I believe that self-esteem acts like a pair of spectacles through which we all view our lives. Self-esteem is constantly making us um, judge everything around us and behave in lots of different ways and it affects our confidence and our motivation. So the big spectacles on this lad's face is, is hopefully symbolizing this. Um, Self-esteem is always running in the background and we view our lives with that. Our self-esteem affects the stability of the emotional platform from which we achieve. Our self-esteem is the difference between our can and our cannot. And that's so true, right? We're less likely to do something if we don't think we can do it. And one of the things that's kind of fun about what I do is that I'm, I'm not telling any of you anything that you don't know. And I see myself as a little bit like a, um, one of these highlighter markers on a page, right? So I'm just bringing people's attention to this and raising this awareness that this is a really important part of the life of a child with dyslexia. Let's look at this in a bit more detail. We have a bit of fun with this. So this process here is something that happens all the time. You know, we will have a thought and that thought will generate a feeling and then that feeling will generate some kind of behavior. Now, let me give you an example. So um, if I was to mention, um, I don't know, Black Forest Gatto as an example, that nice creamy cake you can get, often it comes out of the fridge, it's nice and cool, big juicy cherries in it, um, very tasty, very sweet, um, a lovely piece of cake. I don't know about you, um, but I, I, just by thinking about that, I can start to almost, almost taste it. I can start my, feel my body starting to think, Ooh, I can oh, I could have a piece of that cake. That'd be nice. Um, and then by going, Ooh, and starting to move my body, to indicating that that's my behavior. Right. Um, let me give you another example. I could mention a spider. Now, some of you on this call might have a phobia of spiders and just by talking about spiders you might find that your brain is starting to think about that and that with that thought you might start to have feelings maybe a little bit anxious a little bit apprehensive maybe you're adjusting your position 
on your chair um, as you try and cope with the thought of a spider. And of course, you know, I can't do anything with spiders with you. Um, I, I did mention this at the last talk I did at the Bell House and I got someone out and I, and I mentioned this to her and she was, even though she said to me, even though I know you didn't have a spider in your bag, John, I was nervous that you had a spider in your bag. And I could see her body language change as a result of talking about spiders. So this is the thing. This is uh, what cognitive behavioral therapy works on, is that we know that thoughts can lead to feelings, which can lead to behavior in, in any context. Let me show you something else, um, which, will, which will help to look at this in more, more deeply. Now, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at this slide and then in the chat, I would like you to tell me what you can see in this pattern. So just, just one or two words, what can you pick out in this pattern just by looking at it? So this is a bit like um, if you are staring in the sky looking at clouds, you might see an elephant flo floating over. And of course it's not an elephant, but great. So I'm starting to see that um, Jill's seeing a face. What else are you seeing? A scary face. Thank you, Jason. Um, any, anyone else there seeing something different there? Uh, a doll, Darren, thank you. Um, Dawn's saying a face. Yeah, the face one's quite obvious, yeah. A bearded face. Ah, yeah, no, no one's said that before. A cat, Linda, that's interesting. Scared gingerbread man, two faces looking at each other. Ah, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so what we're doing here is we think we're interpreting this picture. Yeah, you're, you're very kindly putting down your comments, so thank you for for those that did comment just then. Um, so we're, we're looking at a picture and we're going, oh, I can see this and I can see that. And, and obviously um, there's a very obvious looking face there. Now the reality is what's going on is that your brain is taking this picture and it's, um, if you like, it's comparing it with every bit of data in your brain. It's a bit like um, people of a certain age will be, before mobile phones, we used to have these things called Rolodexes, right? Where, where you'd have people's phone numbers and maybe you'd twist it around and this like card index would, would flick around till you got to the right um, sort of name and address and so forth. And, and that's kind of like what's going on. You know, we're taking this picture into our brain and we're rifling through the filing cabinets of all the things that have gone before us, whether it's our sights, our, the sounds we've experienced, the the taste we've experienced and we're comparing it with all of it and we're coming up with a oh that looks like a scary face because that will relate to something that you've experienced in the past interestingly some people will look at this picture and they won't see anything and it's not because there's no filing cabinet it's just that it doesn't match with any of the experiences they've had in the past um, and that's perfectly normal um, i could put up a different picture and i could see potentially see nothing and you'd see loads of stuff so let me show you what the actual picture is. Oh, that didn't work. Let me just try that again. So yeah, this is the actual picture. And what you're looking at here, obviously, is a snake. Now I've actually had people say, yeah, that's a snake. And I've gone, really? You can see that? Oh. Um, I can still see the scary face in that picture. But actually, now we're seeing the snake. And I'm sure that if I was to go back, you'd probably see the snake in that now because I've shown you the actual picture. So here's the, here's the point of me showing you this. When we are addressing situations, when we come across new experiences, or what we think are new experiences, or when our children are sat in the classroom or being with their friends, or talking to the teacher all of those interactions and experiences will be influenced by this cycle this cycle is happening all the time but what's going on is that we take these experiences these sights these sounds these views and we compare them with what's in the filing cabinet our brains judge the experiences and situations of now and in the future all the time and it does this by comparing what is happening what, what's happened in the past and how we've dealt with them. You know, if, you know, if someone's got a problem, they go, oh, I've got a solution for that. I tried this 20 years ago. Well, it may work, but it might not work because it's a different, it's 20 years on. 
No, our brains use the data of our past thoughts, feelings, and behavior to inform the now. So if we've had challenging circumstances in the past, as a child with dyslexia, that's a challenge. Often our perspective of life now and in the future will have been informed by these experiences. So for example, with my daughter Jess, as she went into secondary school and she was asked to read more text, to read out in public, the intensity of the emotions will have come from the thoughts and feelings that she was comparing to in previous scenarios, which perhaps myself and my wife didn't know about. And it's the conclusions that we make about our past experiences and significant influences that informs our self-esteem. It's, it's a classic, you know, it, it, we hear about people who, who maybe um, have, a, have a car accident, right? And then, and then they'll get back into a car sometime later and they will be anxious because they'll be worrying about the potential of another car crash. And that's an extreme. There could be a whole number of reasons why we might be anxious about what we're facing. But actually that might be incorrect because the situation might be different to that with which we're comparing. But the problem is, thinking like that becomes the tail that wags the dog. If every situation we go into, we start from a place where we tell ourselves that we're not able to do it, that's going to cause a problem for us. It happens to us as adults, it happens to us as kids. Dyslexic or not. But I think that dyslexia increases the probability of poor self-esteem because if we're struggling to be academic in school, then maybe we make life choices based on that when we don't need to. Ironically, my daughter with her first in musical theatre, what she got her highest marks in with the right intervention was her dissertation, her written work, and her ability to communicate the academic side of what she was learning. And the stuff that she was really, really good at, she didn't get really as high marks on, but that was fine, she still got great marks. But it was kind of ironic that the, the academic stuff that she avoided, she actually did really well in, and she went at it, and she believed that she could do what, what she needed to do to get through. And she pleasantly surprised herself. I know from me personally, and I'm mildly dyslexic and I have a, um, a diagnosis of ADHD, I know that I've made decisions in the past which has been based on avoidance or based on lack of self-belief. When I had everything within me to, to do that thing that I avoided. And I do what I do because I want young people not to have to go through that. I want young people to move away from a perspective of I'm useless or I'm not good enough. And I want them to think, I'm going to give it my best shot. I can do this. Or if it doesn't go quite so well, well, what can I change to make it better next time? And what we're talking about here is changes of perspective. So that is the end of my presentation. We're going to do some questions in a minute, but I do want to just remind you of the part two for this, um, which will be at the Dyslexia show in September. Um, it's not my show, I should add, so I'm, I'm, I'm supporting it because I think it's a really good thing. Um, what I would also say to you is that if you can't make that, um, I will be putting stuff out increasingly about self-esteem and for parents to be able to use to support their kids and um, you could either you'll be able to find out some of that on the study with dyslexia blog if you want to go there and subscribe if you do please check the parent box on the sub subscribe box um, or if you want to go to my specific parenting group and join parenting dyslexia and um, 
you go to that, that website and um, sign up and click parent again. Um, and I'll send you a bunch of free resources and you can join my Facebook group if you want of uh, it's almost 2000 members, 2000 parents who are sharing ideas and thoughts about supporting their children with dyslexia. So I'll leave that up there so you can take a note of it, but um, I'm at the end of my presentation. So thank you for listening and I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, Lucinda, do you want to? Well, I just want to say um, first, actually, John, thank you very much. This is an emotive issue and impacts hugely on our children. Um, so thank you for taking us through all the cognitive issues. And I'm sure there will be um, plenty of questions in a minute. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that, um, you know, please do join uh, the Bell House um, mailing list. Um, and um, Bell House is a community project which um, you can support either by volunteering or via the donate button. Um, and actually, I, I saw in the questions that were coming up on the chat, I, I do hope some of you are putting up questions actually ready for John in a minute, but um, um, Bell House actually runs a variety of support and events, which you can find on the website. Um, and we do do screenings for dyslexia here at Bell House. Um, and we also do touch typing courses, especially designed for, uh, for children with dyslexia. But um, uh, right now I'm gonna hand you over to Lucinda for questions. Thank you, Suzanne. And just so everyone knows, I'm going to stop recording just right now.